Okay, friends. Hello. I guess the light is a little bit bright here. It's a sunny day and the, the sun is um, reflecting exactly into, mm, into my eyes. So I'll have to look a bit overlit for a little while until the sun changes its position. Um, we have, we're on Esoteric Astrology 154A. I think I made a mistake uh, earlier. Uh, I wrote the wrong 150 figure. Anyway, we've been through this um, chart by Annie Besant where the colors may well relate to colors um, prominent in a previous solar system um, and where there are some unusual rulers given for the um, connected with the various aspects and, and principles such as Mercury for love, wisdom, well, it's certainly the Lord of wisdom in a sense, but not so much the Lord of love, and I've connected with the Ajna Center. Venus, I've connected with the higher mind. It is. It does seem to be the repository of the third super principle at this time, and its color is oftentimes considered to be indigo, at least in terms of its higher rays. The esoteric color of the fifth ray, however, is indigo, and we have the blue of the higher rays of Venus, and bronze is related to copper. It's uh, some kind of um, amalgam involving uh, 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 involving copper and zinc, um, but it is also uh, based. Copper is the planet, um, rather copper associates with the planet Venus. In terms of the different metals, you know how it goes: silver for the moon and gold for the sun and uh, lead for Saturn and tin for um, Jupiter and um, iron for Mars. I don't think there is a particular metal associated with the Earth. Mercury for Mercury, of course. Then we talked about conflict. Uh, DK does say that um, Saturn is a bringer of conflict. Um, and that has to be understood, but in terms of the ray, or at least uh, the seven rays, I think it's incorrect, or at least it's certainly not what we deal with in our understanding at this time. So um, Saturn is a bringer of conflict and a destroyer. It has a lot of first ray in it, but we're talking here about the fourth ray, and it's not called harmony through conflict. The lower mind uh, connected with the moon is reasonable. Mars, of course, very reasonable connected with devotion. Jupiter has its ceremonial aspect. And is the, uh, let's say, Jupiter as the uh, lord, of, mm -mm, lord of ceremonial worship, as DK will later tell us in this appendix. Uh, so it has its seventh ray quality, but bright blue doesn't seem to associate. It associates more with Jupiter than with the ray itself. Matter of fact, you can see that the assignments that she's given are connected to the planet and not, um, not so much uh, to the ray. Uh, but the rose color in terms of Mercury seems amiss. Flame is a useful color for the first ray, that correlates. But rose does not co correlate with um, Mercury. Uh, blue does correlate with Venus. Green with Saturn, yes. Uh, violet with the moon. Uh, especially if Uranus is the ruler, and sometimes Uranus can be not only the occult mind, but the more conventional scientific mind. Bright blue, yes, with uh, Jupiter, but not with magic. So there is a figure here that begins our discussion in this figure is the sacred and non-sacred planets and we see Vulcan with its first ray soul correlating with Pluto with its first ray personality we judge that the rays given for the non-sacred planets are the personality rays um, there is a transition uh, in process uh, from uh, in, in a number of the non-sacred planets uh, moving towards their soul ray but whether that transition is yet in process for Pluto or for Mars remains to be seen. Mercury with its fourth ray correlates with the moon veiling a hidden planet. 
Venus with its fifth ray does not correlate. We do not have, well, I'm sure that in the solar system there are fifth ray planets. Uh, even the recent planet in the neighborhood of Pluto by the name of Eris seems to correlate with the fifth ray. But it is uh, apparently not a planet veiled by the moon or by the sun. Jupiter with its second ray correlates with the sun veiling a second ray hidden planet, probably of a non-sacred type. Uh, Saturn with its third ray correlates with the Earth, uh, yes. And Neptune with its sixth ray correlates with Mars, and Uranus does not correlate, though we... Uh, Okay, it says this makes a, a total of 12 planets. It is the esoteric division. Well, 7 and seven and 5 are uh, considered um, an esoteric and exoteric mode of dividing, with the 5 related more to Brahma and the third aspect, and the 7 related to Vishnu and the second aspect. Ah... Uh. Okay. Right. So that is a um, a brief rundown um, of the correlations. Now we don't know yet what these hidden planets may be. It's not Vulcan. And uh, some propositions have been put forward that the moon is veiling a planet by the name of Rex which is involved in conflicted situations, and the sun veiling perhaps a planet by the name of Adonis, which is uh, one of the intra-mercurial planets. I wonder about Adonis in relation to the Ahamkara principle. Uh, I'm trying to... Uh, Adonis was known for his beauty, and um, I believe he was uh, fascinated by his own beauty, Let's see how that might work out. Um, if I was to look for the epitome of uh, Adonis mythologically, um, in Greek mythology is the god of uh, beauty and desire and is the central figure in various mystery religions. His religion belonged to women. The dying of Adonis was fully developed in the circle of young girls around the poet Sappho from the island of Lesbos around 600 B.C. Interesting. Adonis was one of the most complex figures in classical times. He has had multiple roles, and there's been much scholarship over the centuries concerning his meaning and purpose in Greek religious beliefs. He is an annually renewed, ever youthful vegetation god. Uh, that would fit with the sun supporting the vegetation. A life death, rebirth deity, like the sun perhaps, whose nature is tied to the calendar. His name often is often applied in modern times to handsome youths of whom he is the archetype. Adonis is often referred to as the mortal god of beauty. Um, the most detailed and literary version of the story is a late one. The central myth Greek telling of Aphrodite fell in love with the beautiful youth, Venus perhaps, uh, because possibly because she had been wounded by Eros's er arrow, uh, Aphrodite sheltered Adonis as a newborn baby and entrusted him to Persephone. Uh, Persephone was also killed by Adonis' beauty, taken by Adonis' beauty, and refused to give him back to Aphrodite. And Persephone may be one of those, um, it's a, certainly an asteroid, uh, and one wonders whether it's an outer planet related to Pluto. The dispute between the two goddesses was settled by Zeus, or by Calliope, on Zeus's behalf. Adonis was to spend one third of every year with each goddess, and the last third wherever he chose. It sounds like the seasons are involved. He chose to spend two thirds of the year with Aphrodite. Adonis was killed by a wild boar. Mars is the prototype of the wild boar. Said to have been sent vicariously by Artemis, jealous of Adonis' hunting skill, or in retaliation for Aphrodite in instigating the death of Hippolytus, a favorite of the huntress goddess, or by Aphrodite's paramour, Eris, who was jealous of Aphrodite's love for Adonis, possibly. This wild boar was sent by a number, it seems, or by Apollo, to punish Aphrodite for blinding his son 
Aramanthus, Adonis died in Aphrodite's arms, who came to him when he heard, uh, when she heard his groans. When he died, she sprinkled the blood with nectar, from which sprang the short-lived anemone, which takes the name from the wind, which so easily makes its petals fall. And so it is the blood of Adonis that each spring turns to red the torrential river, the Adonis River, also known as the Abraham River, or Nair Ibrahim in Arabic, in modern Lebanon. Afqua is the sacred source where the waters of the river emerge from a huge grotto in a cliff 200 meters high, and it is there the myth of Astarte, Venus, and Adonis was born. Well, um, this tells us something about it. I think we're not dealing with... Um, uh, Narcissus, no. Adonis is quite different from that. Um, as always with these Greek myths, there are a number of versions, and we have to find the one that is most esoteric. But anyway, one wonders about Adonis. It's very attractive. Um, possibly second ray. Everyone falls in love with him. Uh, he's close to the sun, which is the second ray. And one would wonder whether this is the non-sacred, intramercurial, second-rate planet which the sun veils. Can it be even closer than Vulcan to the sun? I'm not sure. But it is something to be, um, to be worked with. So here we have the figure, and we have um, discussed that figure. Um, now we go on with the sacred and non-sacred planets and the rays. Here's from Cosmic Fire. The, the um, Well, I think I better copy one of these if I'm going to succeed in making notes. <clears throat> the exoteric non-sacred planets are called, uh, in occult parlance, the outer round or the outer circle of the initiates the exoteric non-sacred planets. In other words, they are revealed, uh, one knows they exist, and they also have not achieved yet the uh, fifth cosmic planetary initiation, but as I discussed before, the word cosmic is uh, difficult because there seem to be um, three terms, uh, or three two levels of initiation, and three different terms which uh, relate to those. Major cosmic, cosmic, and an unnamed uh, type of initiation in which there can be um, seven, for instance, for the Earth. And yet they are, in a sense, cosmic initiations, but they are lesser initiations than the normal cosmic or the major cosmic. So anyway, they haven't taken the fifth in that series, and they are called the outer round or the outer circle of initiates. They certainly are initiates in relation to the solar system. Uh, the Earth, for instance, is an initiate of the first degree. Perhaps there are some planetary logoi who have not yet even taken their first initiation. This is possible. It would bring into their um, expression more soul-centeredness, such as our planetary logos of the earth is struggling for. And yet they are all, in a sense, dragons of wisdom, at least when compared to the human being. Uh, of these, uh, our earth is one, but being aligned in a peculiar fashion with certain spheres or planets on the inner round, a dual opportunity exists for humanity. Certain spheres or planets on the inner round. Now, there can be, um, be Mercury, uh, but also, these spheres can be hidden um, chains or even hidden planetary schemes. So we do have a kind of dual opportunity uh, here uh, for humanity, which facilitates while it complicates the evolutionary process. One way of looking at the dual opportunity is the possibility of proceeding through initiation or not.
So uh, many will not specifically undertake the rigors of initiation, but will go through um, elevations with all of humanity. Um, the the inner round, or uh, let's say progress on certain spheres or planets, they may be planets or spheres. Now spheres, we say mm, the word spheres may link them to uh, hidden chains. And the planetary Logoi may have uh, three hidden chains chains, just as the subjective higher three spheres uh, in the Kabbalah. Well, how should we spell that? I mean, there's so many ways to spell Kabbalah, <laughs> even with a Q. I don't know the implications of them. Here's another way. Okay. With certain spheres or planets on the inner round. So the inner round can mean a developmental opportunity on hidden spheres. This can be one meaning of the inner round. Let me just write it down. Um, the inner round, that's it, can mean a uh, certain uh, developmental opportunities on hidden planets or spheres. Uh, I uh, ch spheres chains because every every living form there, whether it's a globe or a chain or a planetary sphere, takes the form a uh, planetary uh, scheme takes the form of a sphere. So uh, within our own uh, planetary scheme, there can be hidden chains. I remember Jeffrey Baborka was counting as many as uh, twelve, I think whether one winds up with a 10 or a 12 uh, much depends on the context. Uh, DK has given us uh, as many as 10 planetary chains in our planetary scheme. But the number change, just like perhaps uh, the number of chakras change depending on whether you are going forth or returning. The sacred planets are often called seven grades of psychic knowledge or the seven divisions of the field of knowledge. This is interesting terminology and well psyche is related to the second ray and all of the uh, sacred planets are dragons of wisdom. Uh, in the dragon of wisdom the uh, love aspect has been stimulated uh, and not just the monastic aspect but of course they are not yet uh, not yet lions of cosmic will um, so interesting uh, titles here um, what we can call uh, the outer circle of initiates the outer round or the outer circle of initiates. That's one possibility and uh, one name. Make them a little bigger here. And then the seven grades of psychic knowledge, the sacred planets. And the psychism fits with the idea of the dragon of wisdom where the second aspect, the psychic aspect, is emphasized. And the seven divisions of the field of knowledge. So that emphasizes the monastic aspect, but none of it emphasizes yet the will aspect. All right. The following from the Secret Doctrine, page 445, Secret Doctrine 3, page 445, diagram 2, is suggestive, though exoteric and deliberately misleading, as the sacred and non-sacred planets are mixed together and many planets omitted altogether. So we have to try to... Uh, at least to detect the blinds. Maybe we can do that. Um, okay, let's take a look. Right. The planet, the human principle, the color of the weekday. Well, Mars, Kamarupa, the desire body, red in the undeveloped 
desire body and Tuesday, yes. The sun, prana, and life, color orange, uh, and c correlated with Sunday. Mercury, booty, yellow, Wednesday. Saturn, camomanus, that is, um, it seems like a blind. The, uh, the camomanus of Saturn seems inaccurate, as does the green. But the lower mind, but lower mind can be associated with green, but also with orange and even a form of yellow. Jupiter, the auric envelope, blue, good enough. Venus, higher manus, in a way. As we have discussed, it is the home of the three uh, super principles at this time. The moon, lingus, herrera, violet. We've been through this one before. And uh, as... Um, D.K. is uh, saying of this secret doctrine uh, tabulation, it's exoteric and s deliber deliberately misleading. Well, let's just say that uh, we can substitute Uranus for the moon, possibly, and we'd have to see what we will substitute for prana or life. Will it be Vulcan? What substitutions will we make? Okay, get rid of that. And what substitutions will we make? Um, okay. The auric envelope in a large and expanded sense. It could be associated with the causal body, yes, and Jupiter is one of those causal planets. But also, as I said, it has a particular connection with the monadic plane, with the monadic vehicle, as the hierarchical ruler of Virgo, which is the sign associated with that monadic plane. But Saturn as Camel Manus, um, hmm, I think we would have a better, uh, we could easily reverse these with Venus connected with Camel Manus. Um, and Mercury could be connected simply with Manus or Lower Manus. Some reversals are possible. Reversals here. Saturn could indicate uh, the higher mind uh, under the uh, third ray. And Venus like Sirius, so often associated with Camomanus. Uh, because Venus has both Kama and Manus uh, in its nature through the soft and the hardline rays. So that's a possible reversal. You know, when you're looking at the spiritual triad, you kind of uh, wonder at times how to assign the planets to the rulership over the various vehicles. Now, Saturn is certainly connected with the atmic sheath, but so is Vulcan, and Uranus can as well. Uranus has a connection with the lower mind, yes, but so does Saturn. It's only the soft-line planets that are connected here with booty, and neither Saturn nor Vulcan in its usual first ray expression. Later it has a heart of the sun connection, and then we could see about other uh, affiliations of that planet. Okay. So we did go through this before, and um, the, the days of the week seem a reasonable correspondence. The colors are also fairly accurate, but the colors do not Green is difficult to correlate with Kamamanus. The um, sort of a, a color of orange and maybe rose could be correlated with Kamamanus together. It's the blending. Uh, in, in a way, another way to look at Kamamanus is to look at the blend of Mercury and um, Venus. Venus definitely has a kamic, attractive, desirous side. But of course it means so much of a higher nature as well. You know, it, it has to do with higher mind, 
ruling almost the entirety of the higher three planes, well, at least two subplanes of the higher mental plane, and then the question arises, does it really rule the third subplane of the higher mental plane? There, I just w I want to say this, that on the third subplane of the higher mental plane, Vulcan can have a place because the jewel in the lotus is found uh, on the border between the uh, first subplane of the higher mental plane and the buddhic plane. This is interesting because the jewel in the lotus, um, well, you know, to what extent is it really part of the egoic lotus and to what extent is it the transposition of the monad into that lotus? The jewel in the lotus does not appear to be um, found on either the third subplane of the mental plane or the second, but rather on the first. And that could give a kind of a... The jewel itself is a Vulcanian formulation. Vulcan works with metals and he also works with jewels. The height of the mineral kingdom is the jewel-like uh, formation. Okay, let's see what further we can say. Such blinds are frequent and necessary. He says they are necessary in the occult teaching but they will be used less and less as humanity becomes more spiritually perceptive. So now we have a group of spiritually perceptive uh, students. And maybe uh, in the next uh, installment, Master D.K. will write less with blinds, perhaps. <clears throat> and, of course, you know, given what he has already given us in some of his more explicit material, we can go back to former blinds and see if we can unveil them, unravel them, see through them. Um, we can see how the blinding process occurred. And I would just want to say this, if we can see the method of blinding, or the methods, uh, perhaps we can interpret them more accurately. Perhaps we can do that. Several great psychological lives qualified by seven types of life force are manifesting through the medium of the seven planets. Well, this is a good way of describing the planetary logo. Five other lives express themselves through five planets, of which two remain to be discovered. Um, seven great psychological lives. The sun is not included, substituted. The sun here is substituted for Vulcan. Okay. Then there is Jupiter and there is Saturn. Interesting about this combination, uh, this... Whoop, Uh, this combination has two of the three planets which now embody the super principles. Something I looked up just a little while ago, right? The super principles, rays one, two, and three are the first three aspects, basically. Uh, but Saturn, of course, was the... Uh, Venus was one of them, and... Um, Vulcan has its present first ray in strength. Saturn, predominantly the third ray, one could almost look at this as a triangle of rays one, two, and three, with Vulcan representing the first ray. So above, we have a triangle represent, uh, representing uh, rays one, two, three. Saturn is probably a third ray soul, and maybe is so powerfully on the third ray that its monad is that as well. We know for sure that its monad is the third ray. With Jupiter, we know its soul is the second ray. And with Vulcan, we are pretty sure that it's, uh, since it's a sacred planet, in a way two, uh, twice as far as Earth is in the transmutation process, 
that uh, Vulcan has a first-rate soul rather than a personality. I, I don't know if he ever in the teaching says, when I give you a ray of a non-sacred planet, I'm giving you the personality ray. When I give you the ray of a sacred planet, I'm giving you the soul ray, but one can assume this is a reasonable uh, possibility. Then we go on um, to Mercury, Venus, Mars, and the moon can be substituted for Uranus. Well, uh, five other lives express themselves through five planets, of which two remain to be uh, discovered. But we don't have a division of five here. Well, in a way we have a division of five. But in, in this division, we do not have two remaining to be discovered. Mercury and Venus are sacred planets, Mars non-sacred. The moon, in this case, is not veiling uh, a hidden planet, because Uranus is not hidden, and Pluto. In what order are these given? Well, we can see that the, there is a ray order to these planets. There is a ray order to the presentation. Uh, presentation of these planets. So, uh, in a way, you see Vulcan as ray 1, Jupiter ray 2, Saturn ray 3, Mercury ray 4, Venus ray 5 in its soul nature, Mars ray 6. Uh, and, you know, you almost feel that, okay, and, and, and the moon, in this case, ray 7. Three planets remain. Pluto with its ray one personality, a non-sacred. The Earth with its ray three personality. And here, Neptune may be connected with the second ray. It has the second ray monad. Uh, and there is an undiscovered planet as well. So it really would have been four planets remain after the five. So there's three and five make eight plus four is twelve. The Earth with its um, uh, third ray personality, second ray soul, and first ray monad, which is called the uh, ineffective at this time. Um, two undiscovered planets. Actually, okay. Um, here are three. Aha. Well, they're not really... I see the Sun is not really a planet, so we really have 13 factors listed here. 3 plus... Well, how does it go? 3 plus 5 is 8, plus 4 is 12. No, it's 12. My counting is off. And um, why Neptune... It, it, it would be better, it seems to me. Why not substitute Neptune for Mars in the list above. Then the ray enumeration would be complete among sacred planets. But he uh, brings Neptune into a second category. Of course, we're also told that Neptune really doesn't belong to our solar system at all. My my colleague uh, Nicholas feels that Neptune is connected with um, the star Fomalo, uh, which could be considered a kind of a solar plexus center in the seven solar systems, of which ours is one. Time will tell, of course, and more likely not so much time as the confirmation or lack of it by Master D.K. If he feels that it's not something we can necessarily determine by ourselves, but perhaps should be able to. Um, anyway, the undiscovered planets in our system, we, we would have to say one non-sacred planet veiled by the sun and another, another non-sacred planet veiled by the moon. And then I wondered, you know, are we dealing with, uh, big question mark, Adonis, and are we dealing with uh, something called uh, 
Rex. Rex doesn't have an altogether uh, happy reputation. But basically, what we have here, um, we have the sun and a list then of seven sacred planets in a row. But the three are somehow separated. Let's see how this works out in... Um, I, I don't want to trust the way I have this... Um, Well, there seem to be, aha, uh -huh, okay, and there's a third category. I see that. I didn't see. But, but if you really look at this, the first seven are really the seven rays in sacred planets. The sun can be considered independent. It's more like Martanda and his 12 brothers, really. The next five, if we reverse Mars and Neptune, would be the non-sacred planets, two of which remain undiscovered. This is said to be the exoteric uh, division. And why would these five, you know, f four including Pluto, be connected in the first categories? Because Pluto is the transformer. Uh, interesting that Neptune is the secondary monad, Earth is the secondary soul, can we be talking about the second ray undiscovered planet here? Why are these listed in this manner? Um, it's not because they necessarily convey the first ray. They are all conveying their, conveying their own ray and even transmitted from the constellations. Well, Uranus transmits the first ray and also from the constellation Aries and Leo. Mars transmits the first ray. Mercury transmits the first ray, strangely, because it rules Aries. And Venus, well, I'm beginning to see, but Venus is hierarchical in that sense. Venus is not the ruler of any one of the constellations transmitting the first ray. But we can put it like this. Um, that uh, those planets, those above five planets, all either emit or transmit the first ray if the hierarchical rulership is allowed in the case of Venus. That might be possible. But mostly it looks like simply an ordering of the planets according to their rays. But then comes Pluto, and Neptune should not be considered a non-sacred planet. That would be an exoteric division, wouldn't it? Mars and Neptune should be substituted. But if we leave Neptune, the Earth, and the undiscovered together, we may be talking, may, maybe, um, maybe all planets in Division 2 have a strong second ray component. We certainly know that the Earth and Neptune do, and uh, if uh, we're dealing with the undiscovered planet on the second ray, veiled by the Sun, uh, the undiscovered planet on the second ray, uh, veiled by the Sun, would complete the, the triangle in which the second ray would be important. At least um, there are ways of relating these three if the undiscovered is that one. Then with the third aspect, we just have one undiscovered planet, the, the moon, connected with the third aspect, and matter would veil a fourth ray planet. The moon connected with the third aspect and matter would veil another non-sacred planet, this time on the fourth ray, not on the third ray. But the moon itself has such a strong uh, third ray association. 
So sometimes when we go back into the mixing and blending, which has been accomplished um, through earlier presentations of astrology, not so explicitly esoteric, we have a bit of unveiling and unraveling to do, don't we? As to why the grouping should have been presented in that manner. Of course, Master DK would have a much more um, sophisticated and illuminating uh, reason for that presentation, but anyway, I've tried to make some sense out of it, some rationality connected with it. Interestingly, the sun is in the very first group, uh, and the moon, not substituting for substituted for Uranus, but sub, but rather the moon substituted for an undiscovered planet would be then in the third group, with the sun then representing spirit and the moon representing matter. That would be the opposites, with the planets uh, rep, uh, having a second ray uh, connection, a second aspect connection being in the middle. The kingdoms of nature and planets in this cycle, well, the mineral kingdom, Pluto and Vulcan, we can immediately see Vulcan's connection to the mineral kingdom. Uh, it is a fourth ray planet monadically, I believe, and the mineral kingdom counting from the human down, is the fourth. The mineral kingdom is the fourth ray. Um, or the mineral kingdom relates to the fourth ray if we number from the human kingdom downwards. Pluto represents the tremendous power that is stored uh, in the mineral kingdom and the release of that kind of energy. And Vulcan tells us that that energy is under its compression, which is why it cannot be released. But Pluto represents the liberation of that type of energy. Interestingly enough, and we, we can see the, um, let's see, INTL, interestingly, yes, we have the two planets connected with the first initiation, which uh, is uh, symbolically Lemurian and uh, related to the mineral kingdom. So these are the two planets which are powerful before the first initiation, Vulcan driving to the depths of matter and Pluto bringing up all that has to be expelled, expiated, purified a great big purification uh, proceeds before the first initiation. In a way, it's uh, the fourth, counting from the fourth. And I suppose there is much uh, destruction of the form which occurs here. I mean, if we were to go um, here, you know this one, of course. If we were to go to page uh, 71, we would see that at the first initiation, maybe it's more page 70, the disciple has to contend with the crystallizing and destroying forces of Vulcan and Pluto. Crystallizing is particularly related to compacting things so tightly that they break. That's Vulcan. And Pluto, the destroyer. From within, we might say. The influence of Vulcan reaches to the very depth of his nature, preparing for destruction, I think, certain things, but also bringing the will of the soul into which uh, he must bend his will, uh, at least in a physical sense, whilst Pluto drags to the surface and destroys all that hinders in the lower regions. This, of course, the, this section is a golden section, and you can immediately see the relationship, can't you? Um, with what we're studying. The vegetable kingdom is Venus and Jupiter. Can you see the relationship? Venus for magnetism, Jupiter perhaps, and maybe for perfume and color, and Jupiter for its expansiveness and its uh, supportive qualities of all life. The ma animal and uh, human kingdoms live as a result of the vegetable kingdom. They could live without, the, without ingesting the animal kingdom. Now, 
what do you notice? That one planet is missing. And that would be the planet of the sixth ray from its soul perspective, Neptune. And these three, interestingly enough, rule the vegetable uh, kingdom. So we have the Atlantis, uh, Atlantis, we have the vegetable kingdom, the sixth ray, and the second initiation. These are correlated. There actually is a conflict, we are told, between Venus and Jupiter. In, in the Secret Doctrine, that conflict actually shows up uh, between uh, Narada and uh, Brihaspati, Brihaspati, Jupiter, and Narada, um, a kind of Sanat Kumara-like figure who is attempting to encourage uh, a celibacy and a reunion of the sexes, in a way, in oneness. Narada uh, represents a, a transmutative energy, and Jupiter here represents the continual support of the ancestral gods who procreate in the normal manner. So Venus and Jupiter, although uh, allied through the second ray, and even through the sixth ray in a certain sense, there, there's an aspect of Jupiter which is very, shall we say, enthusiastic. And that kind of enthusiasm correlates, perhaps, with this sixth ray. They are connected uh, via the second ray, for sure, and also with Neptune, another ruler of the second initiation, via the second ray. And, of course, the sixth ray connect connected to the astral plane. You see that more than one planet may be involved in the initiations of man. But notice, um, if these planets are involved in the initiations, they bring in the uh, signs they rule. So Taurus, and let's even just, just thinking exoterically for a moment. Um, the... Here, this would bring in, Venus would bring in Taurus and Libra and um, Jupiter would bring in uh, Pisces and Sagittarius. Perhaps in the longing of the stalk for the sun, the orientation towards the sun, we would see Sagittarius effect. Neptune again would bring in Pisces and maybe Cancer and the need for moisture and protection and so forth. Pluto would bring in Scorpio, important at the first initiation, and Vulcan would bring in Taurus, the mass and, and the need to master at least the physical vehicle, and possibly Virgo as well, but that would be a more esoteric sense. We could also bring in um, esoteric and hierarchical, hierarchically related signs, but whether they would specifically be related to the, uh, to the kingdom or to the initiation correlated with the kingdom we would have to examine. Well, the animal kingdom, I mean, you know, it's so, it's so clear. The animal kingdom here is Moon and Mars. And, uh, indeed, these are the two planets associated with the uh, third initiation, with, uh, I think, uh, Vulcan veiled by the moon. It's said to veil the hidden planet. And if uh, what happened to St. Paul is any uh, example, he seemed to be much struck by Vulcan at the time of the third degree and blinded through the excessive light, which D.K. says the Akashic Record confirms. So it's a question of spiritual will dominating personality will, finally. Spiritual will dominates personality will. Finally, there's a lesser play out of this at the second degree when the will is beginning to come into expression and a great blow is fought against selfishness, but it is not completely conquered. And Mars, as we remember, rules the selfish faculties. So the... Uh, this is really the mastery of the animal nature of man in its entirety.
animal nature of man uh, in its entirety. After, well, pretty much so. Uh, after this, the concentration is not on having to end the ancient authority of the personality. The personality is an animal, really, and is ruled by Mars. And Vulcan is representing the soul nature and the will of the soul. It also represents the atomic will. So the will comes in very strongly, and uh, Vulcan will be a good planet through which the monad can express the degree to the degree it can express at this time. Vulcan is a shambolic uh, planet uh, related to Taurus, uh, at which time, at which full moon, Shambhala is very powerfully uh, present through the Waysak Festival, or the Taurus Festival, as it may be called later, when the term Waysak perhaps disappears, or when the uh, reapproach of the Buddha may disappear. We're told that he did not have to sustain that for very long, perhaps a few decades. Um, and that was back in 1946. So we just don't know about his approach. I think it, it would be very important for the disciples uh, who uh, are inspired by that idea to have that approach. But it is a question of whether it truly continued. I think Mary Bailey in the Arcane School in 1981, which was right 32 years ago, I participated in that with her and with the members of the school, felt that it might no longer exist and that a new keynote may be involving the new group of world servers, also ruled by Taurus and Vulcan, would be taking its place. When it comes to the, the human kingdom, it's interesting. Uh, Mercury, of course, is the major ruler of the fourth creative hierarchy. But these are the uh, two planets um, which rule the fourth initiation. Uh, and, and, of course, they would bring in necessarily Gemini, possibly Virgo, but by the time we get to the fourth initiation, we should be thinking of esoteric rulerships. So they could be an hierarchical rulership. So Mercury, there would be no limitation about what they could bring in, could bring in uh, Gemini, which has been associated with the crucifixion, as we discussed, Virgo, which has not, Aries, which is the sign of all new beginnings, so it begins a phase in which you no longer have to incarnate on Earth, and um, Scorpio, which uh, relates to the fourth ray, and the fourth ray is very, very powerful at this initiation. Saturn would bring in Capricorn, which rules all five initiations, and also Libra, which begins to open the door to Shambhala. Very interesting. We, we do have to, this is, this is something I haven't done much, but when you look at a planet, it is the conduit, then, for what constellation or what sign. And that energy should be brought into relation with it, uh, with where that planet may appear. So the human being can begin to, well, it has intelligence, it can decide under Saturn, and it has the potential for developing the mind and illuminating the mind, and the entire human kingdom, in a way, comes under Mercury. Interestingly enough, uh, because of its fourth ray, the fourth kingdom and the fourth uh, creative hierarchy. Uh, Saturn, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, a lot of talking. Um, Saturn rules the first part of the Antikorana and Mercury, the major aspect, or the major part of the Antikorana. <coughs> Pardon me. And it is the existence of the Antikorana which, of the Antikorana which develops um, mm, 
develops in man the ability to change kingdoms. Now Mercury also has a powerful fifth ray connected with it. Rules the five of the hand, it rules mentality, it rules the Aryan race in an important sense. And that fifth ray will have to do also with the fifth kingdom. Mercury, the fifth globe, the fifth kingdom, the fifth chain. And in a way, Mercury considered as a kind of a fifth scheme, even though its position relative to the sun is not that. Now here is our first deviation from the initiation uh, uh, tabulation, the, the, the planets which rule initiation. Yes, we can say, yes, Uranus uh, does uh, rule the fifth initiation, but not Neptune. Jupiter instead. But so much of what you can say about uh, Neptune, you can say about Jupiter in a lesser way. Uh, Neptune breaks the Jupiterian ring pass knot, but the Jupiterian ring pass knot is very inclusive. So at the fifth degree under Jupiter Uranus, we have a um, beneficent organization. When you enter the kingdom of souls here, we have a, a transition towards the monad, but not entirely uh, focusing within the monad. Neptune connects directly with the monad because of the Pisces connection. I leave the Father's home and turning back I save. And Jupiter because of the Virgo connection. Uh, Uranus is the awakener and uh, let's just say that at the fifth degree, one is entirely free of the need for incarnation. That's even so at the fourth degree. But the, the monad really begins its expression at the fifth degree. Mm. Fifth degree. Uh, then there is the blend of the monadic ray and the true egoic ray, which has been the soul ray and is now the ray of the triad. And the regime of the monad really takes over in its move towards the sixth initiation. Now, synthesizing all these five, can we say, does this relate to the... Um, kingdom of planetary lives or to the uh, kingdom of solar lives. Certainly the sun Uranus relates to the kingdom of solar lives. Sun and Uranus relates to the kingdom of solar lives. We have the divine flames on the Logoic plane and we have a rulership uh, I think we could say by Uranus in a sense as the hierarchical ruler of Leo. It's uh, a Leonian plane and, well, you know, uh, we'll go over to this other chart. These charts prove <clears throat> so ongoingly important. But let's just say that here we have, um, if, if these are all hierarchical rulers, the planet may be the sun, but these are the hierarchical rulers, and so Uranus would be the hierarchical ruler of Leo. So the divine flames, Leo, Uranus, the supreme energy, the sea of fire, the first ray, all of these correlate. So this synthesis is occurring, is occurring on the Logoic plane. But we only have been given five kingdoms and five initiations to correspond with them. And I suppose the synthesis, in a way, could relate to either to the kingdom of planetary lives. The sun is a monad, is a monad, or, or is a symbol for the, of the monad. And the sun can also veil Jupiter, as we 
learned earlier in the book, a strong hint to that effect. That the exoteric sun can be the veil for Jupiter, the esoteric sun the veil for Neptune, the hierarchical sun a veil for Uranus. So we're, we may be looking at the sixth degree here, the planetary lives, and even, in a way, a segue, a bridge to the seventh degree where the sun veils Uranus. When it comes to the, um, when it comes to the sixth degree, the sun would veil Jupiter, Neptune. At the seventh degree, the sun would veil uh, Uranus. Each of these veilings can occur on different levels. The moon can veil Uranus at a very low level. The sun can probably veil Uranus uh, at the level of soul expression, or even at the third degree, let us say, but also a very high level as well. Maybe the sun veils Uranus e even at mastership, in a sense. But the what's given here diverges from the list of initiations and then uses blinds for the kingdoms. I think we are, you know, the kingdom of solar lives is obviously connected with the sun. The kingdom of planetary lives, uh, a strong connection with Neptune and Jupiter. The kingdom of souls, well, Neptune can rule the fourth initiation. It connects with the buddhic plane, which is so prominent at the fourth degree, and Uranus, uh, the liberating power. The two higher synthesizing planets here, and what they can mean in the higher part of, the, of human nature. We are at the point, I've uh, droned on here, <laughs> let's just say that we'll be ending, end of esoteric astrology adventure number 154a, and we're on page 650, 650, or just about 651. And beginning of Esoteric Astrology Adventure number 154B, 650. <clears throat> okay.